Welcome a young man from not so far away. Verona. Verona. Italia. Yeah. Even though you have to be really specific about these things, as we learned earlier on last week. Um, Verona is a city just in the middle, Milano and Venezia, just right in the middle, you know? north of Italy. And he goes by the name of Volkov, but is also called Enrico. That's what your mother calls you, right? Yeah, that's my name, yeah. Okay, so... So, yeah, I'm, I'm a DJ. Uh, I produce under a few, few names, a few projects. One is Volkov, one is Isolate, which is more like house. And one is a project called uh, Rima, which is something I do with Tomu, who's going to do a lecture later on. And uh, also I have my own label called uh, Neroli and uh, I started a few years before another app, another label called Archive, which I still uh, um, sort of manage and I'm doing a bit of A&R for it. Mm. How are all these things related to everything else that is going on in current Italian dance music? Where do you position yourselves? Uh, I'm totally out of Italian dance music system, let's say, you know. For example, like, my labels are not distributed in Italy. They're just some uh, independent stores who buy stuff off English uh, distributors. And, uh, yeah, I rarely DJ in Italy. Uh, I used to have um, a club night in Milan uh, until a couple of years ago. Uh, we had a five years uh, club night and then I stopped for like sort of uh, uh, generation change. They say the clubbers were coming to my party, sort of become older and the, the music wasn't really appealing to the, to the youngsters. So I decided to stop. Apart from that, you know, like, yeah, we're not really relevant for the Italian market. So we even like, uh, I've, uh, I don't have many relationship with other um, artists or DJs or producer from Roma or, you know, I know there's good people, good artists, but Somehow we never crossed paths, so I'm more I'm more down with some of the artists and friends from London or Germany or. You know. So yeah, it's some sort of a cultural diaspora there. Well, just mm -hmm. when I started, uh, I mean, with a label when I started, I just put out the music I liked. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where I, which was, you know, artists like Digo from For Hero. Domu from the early stages and you know other friends like Alex Atias, you know, like a few different artists, you know. I didn't really check for nationality or whatever. It just was the sound that I liked and I just released it. And uh, I, I, I get demos from Italy, of course, mm -hmm. but it's just that the sound is not like what, what I'm looking for, you know. So nowadays it's really difficult, you know. Uh, I mean, we, we're going to speak about this, about how the market is, is difficult nowadays, so it's really hard to to give demos a chance, it really has to be super strong. You cannot, like back in the days, like well, five years ago, six years ago, you could take like one production was all right, and sort of build from that with one, two, three, four singles. Uh, and the sales were still enough to, to do break even. But nowadays, like the production has to be like you know, top quality from the beginning, otherwise it won't succeed in the market. Um, when you started putting that stuff out, I mean, there was a time when you could literally get a Digo record every other week on some label from somewhere. Why? What was your personal approach to have yet another one? Well, well, that time, like when I started, it was a time when Four Hero album came out. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really easy to have Digo, mm -hmm. <laughs> Digo's music. He was doing Four Hero mainly. And uh, which was, uh, you know, the first album, Two Pages, which was a great album, possibly the best record. Well, he won the Mercury Prize, isn't it? Mm. Or Whatever no? that says about Or it was final Mercury Prize. Mm. It was, well, it was generally accepted, not just by the underground, but mm. by the average uh, English listener, let's say, you know? It was a very good album. And then he was doing some incursion, underground incursion, in, with some labels, like there was this two, one, two, two, from Columbus, you know, there was some stuff like that. Anyway, just when I started, I just wanted to make some tracks where were a bit lo-fi, a bit different, you know? Mm -hmm. So we start with some, uh, well, I can play some of the, the, the very first release on, on Archive was something from this guy called Nubian Mind, which was like a, 
a producer, drum and bass producer uh, from Rainforest, also known as Alpha Omega, and he did. Uh, How uh, was your connection with London anyway? Well, I was living in London, and Why I was. Why did you live there? Uh, sort of like experience. Uh, I was writing my thesis at that time at university. What did you study? Uh, economy marketing. Mm -hmm. So when I was there, you know, because my passion was music, I was just hanging out and I, I, I sort of started hanging out at Rainforest. Mm -hmm. So that was the music I liked anyway. So we started to, to meet Dominic and uh, some of his other guys. It was natural so to it have was an outfit. Rainy day somewhere in London. <laughs> The pigeons were strolling around Trafalgar Square. And we were playing table, table tennis in Rainforest and checking tracks. And, uh, and at that moment, you know, I like was drum and bass or, you know, jazzy stuff or, you know, house. We wanted to release some stuff which is, was kind of in the middle, you know, mm -hmm. and give some of his drum and bass producer, like, a chance to, to do other shit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and both me and Digo started our labels, mm -hmm. Archive and 2000 Black. Mm -hmm. We started, like, around the same months mm. with the same distributor. And, uh, and then when we changed, we changed distributor and we were together with Goya, mm -hmm. which is still our distributor nowadays. And uh, you know, the music is changing, years have passed on, but you know, we're still doing the same kind of thing with the same attitude, you know? Mm. But when you speak about attitude and names, I mean, 2000 Black, obviously, um, the inspiration was drawn from that Fela Kuti Roy Ayers track, I guess? Uh, just the name. So, what's the, what was your... No, because it was already a, a regular party, it was drum and bass. So all of a sudden we arrived and we started playing a different music. Okay. And, uh, you know, people were a bit surprised, but uh, after a while, you know, we started to get down. Because it was, as long as there was groove, you know, and the sound system in that place was really something. Was it yours or was it the club? No, no, it's like a, no, no. The sound system is like a, mm -hmm. because the place is a squat place where we do reggae on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. So we had like a, a reggae sound system. Mm -hmm. So that was really famous for drum and bass because of the you know, of course. Mm -hmm. the, so what would be your advice for people who are not lucky enough to have like a proper reggae bound sound system <laughs> right around the corner? And well, you know, like to you know, like to start a party by yourself. Yeah. It's always the best way at a certain point. If you want to do things, you want to make things happen, I think it's better to do your own way rather than wait for someone to, uh, to book you and to make you become a resident. If you're lucky, you're lucky, but it's best to start your thing with your mates uh, and, and do it, you know. And because nowadays, you know, like we, we said, with the market, uh, you know, you can be a producer, but it's very difficult to make money out of production, you know? Uh, because the, the budgets are very tight, the sales are very s scarce, you know, like, so at the end you can use the records, the releases as a promotional tool to go out and DJ or, mm. or do live gigs if you're a musician mm. uh, or a singer, you know? So to be involved in a club night is, is good. And also it's good for connections because uh, you can get people coming from abroad, mm. uh, to play f for you, you know, and you can do an exchange, you can go abroad, you know. I see many people who started as a resident DJs in some parties or doing their own party and then becoming in demand <coughs> worldwide. You know? By doing a good job and spreading the word of yeah, yeah, having yeah, yeah. done a good job. But that could also, if you would be the devil's advocate in that stage, um, mean, okay, I get, find me someone with shitloads of money, um, I get, him to book me all the DJs I ever wanted, and if I do a really good job there, of course, the word will travel. Yeah, it doesn't really... I mean, mm. you can do like that, you know. Mm. It could work, but, you know, I don't think it's something that lasts, you know. Mm. I think you have to start very step by step, slowly. I mean, when we started, we, we were offering, like, a decent fee to the artist. Well, mm. most of them were friends, you know, people we knew. So we're happy to come down and play. And when you have a guest who comes just for, for the cash, or you have a friend coming for a party, you can see the difference from the way they DJ, you know? So the actual fact was really special. At a certain point, we had some parties with like two guests from, two guests from abroad. 
just because we were all wanted to hang out. So we had Digo, me and like Alex Atia, so you know, like Ian O'Brien and Titonton, just because we were friends, wanted to hang out and play together. So, you know, everyone got paid a little bit less, but you can see the interaction in the night and everything, you know? But the funny thing, when we were doing these parties, we were just like, no promotion at all, mm -hmm. no flyers, nothing, just word of mouth. And we weren't, uh, mail out by internet like nowadays mm -hmm. because it was still the beginning of email. <laughs> Not everyone using email, so it was really. You mean all those emails about playlists of clubs? Yeah, you yeah. just never. But wanted something, to go but something. The first. You know, it's full of internet DJs now. You know, mm -hmm. just people who send without request their playlist, and, and then they pretend to be famous because they are on some. They are everywhere in, in all the mailboxes, kind of thing. You know, without exiting, ex mm -hmm. going out of their living room or bedroom. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, I mean, there, there seems to be a lot of that playlist, CD, uh, look at something, hey, I got something you don't have, kind of thing going on, especially in that scene. Why is that? Uh, you know, people think to be really cool because they play the latest uh, releases of CDRs, you know? I think that the thing went a bit too far, you know? Because it's not, even if you have the latest tracks on CDs, whatever, if you cannot mix or do a proper set with a certain logic or you can or give emotion to the crowd, you're not a good DJ even if you have the latest uh, tracks, you know. And, and then also there was a, a, a phenomenon, I think last year especially, that people started copying tracks of CDs and sending it over to, to, you know, like for example, like Dominic or me going to play somewhere give a, a CD of some recent productions to like some guy, resident, whatever. And then the guy maybe make a copy and give it to a sort of friend, you know, oh, yeah, just keep it for yourself, you know. And all of a sudden you see your tracks in Russia, in Norway, it's like, you know, like, and sometimes because of the problem with the release, because, you know, uh, it's not that we don't want to release the stuff on time, but it's just because there are some <laughs> manufacturing times and, and some other, you know, money problems sometimes with the distributor not paying and everything. <coughs> The records come out like nine, ten months after the track is actually done, and and so with all these people playing tracks of internet radio, charting it and stuff, mm -hmm. and you know when the record is actually in the shop, what? it's a bit of a problem, you know, mm -hmm. because people think like oh, it's old, you know, I've heard it all, all the time, I've heard it too much. So I, I don't think uh, I think it affects the market, mm -hmm. the small market we have. So I think more and more people, more and more DJs, some of our friends stop giving CDs, you know. It's not mm -hmm. a form of uh, disrespect, it's just that we know that people get excited about the tracks and they want to play to friends and, and give it to, to people, but a band, you know, is affecting the little, <laughs> the little sales. I mean, if the f I mean, what are the numbers now anyway? It's hard to guess because everyone you meet, they, they always like pretend like they're selling so many records, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm selling lots of stuff, and, but but the reality is like, you know, like even big labels used to do like house stuff and used to do like eight thousand as in hmm? okay, yeah, eight thousand, ten thousand copies of certain titles, you know. Now they, they do two thousand, three thousand if the track is really really strong. And uh, you know, in the underground labels, we used to do 2,000, mm -hmm. go to 1,000. But if a record is not strong, it goes even to 700, 800 copies. Mm -hmm. You know, and people will start with a brand new label. You know, like sometimes they just do five, six hundred copies. Mm -hmm. It's really tough, really tough because uh, if you do your own stuff on your own label. At least you know you do five, six hundred copies, and you you got your break even. You're happy. You is the music out, and you build from there. But if someone is signing a track, so he has to pay for a manufacturer, he has to pay for a little bit of money to the artist as an advance or something, and and then it's, it, it sells like seven hundred copies or whatever, it's a bit <coughs> it's a bit difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, like I mean, me, I'm I'm by myself. You know, I do this in the spare time, like the label. I don't, I don't do mail out, so I don't spend money on mail out. I don't do any type of promotion. I just concentrate on signing good tracks, stuff that I think is good, and build it from there. And and wait the DJ to sort of do the marketing, the the word of mouth kind of thing. 
Uh, and so they, I tried to get the expenses as cheap as possible. And I'd rather spend like 100 euro more on, on um, label design, because I want the product to look good. Just for myself, not just, just as a fashion item on, on the shelves, you know, but just because I like the product to look good. You know, a bit of fetishism, you know, as a DJ. <laughs> And, and I like to give 100, 100 euro more to, to the artist, the singer, because I think you know it can build it from there, rather than spend it on promotion. And, but nowadays you, you can see like big labels uh, of our scene selling less copies of of an independent labels, you know, because at the end of the day nowadays people have less money to buy records. They go in the shop and really buy what what is really heavy for them, what is really good, and. Uh, uh, and small labels are, sell, are selling sometimes the same copies of companies who have like maybe 10 employees. So we know by fact, because <laughs> we, we, I mean, I'm signed with projects on other labels, so I know the quantities. And uh, for, for me, sometimes it's crazy because I see like with no promotion, uh, I'm selling more copies than the stuff that I, I, I produce for, for other labels, which are bigger, with more people in, involved. We do promo mail out and everything, but so just forget about everything, or just no. I just say to people like go independent is, is great because you have total control on your stuff, and and you know like personally, I think uh, the more difficulties are on the market, the more you push yourself to do a better product. So there's a selection nowadays. It's not. Like, it used to be so much crap on vinyl, you know, some waste of vinyl really around. Nowadays, you know, I think the quality around is, is a bit better in every style, you know, because mm. people otherwise, you know, lose money. Mm. <laughs> Simple as that. So it's sort of, it's, it's like a cleaning out of... A healthy process. Yeah, it is a healthy process, but still we want, you know, <laughs> more people to be involved and, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the problem is, like, is that some distribution companies are going bankrupt. And so that's, that's affecting the labels. So the labels really have problems in taking risks. And like, for example, uh, a recent phenomenon is about the remixes, you know, a good way of making money, you know. Like you do your own label, you do your own production, and then you get asked to do remixes. Same, th same thing like with gigs, you, you get a bit of cash doing remixes. But nowadays, no one has money to, to spend on remixes. So it's all a swap thing, you know. So you swap, you do a remix for someone else, you know, the other guy does a remix for you, you, you release it on your own label, it's great. But this is great, especially when, uh, when the artist who offer you the swap is some artist you like, you, <laughs> you sort of you know, trust. Mm. Otherwise, it's not, it's not a great deal, really. But also, we've heard a lot of these stories with swaps not happening because the artist agreed on it and some management jumped in and going like, no, 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 you oh, you're not on an equal kind of name, so you need to put this on top and blah, blah, blah. And so it takes ages until something really happens. Or has this well, mellowed swap, out now? To be honest, uh, I think it's really funny. Like, if you ask mm. someone who's a bit more famous than you mm. to do a swap, it's not that you have to add, uh, like, oh, yeah, I'll give you a remix and. 357 mm. euro on top of it, you know, I think it's, it's rubbish, you know, like, mm. if, if it's... It's a little a bit like playing golf, eh? With handicap. Yeah, with handicaps, yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. But I think you, you, if you both trust yourself, uh, mm. you, you're going to make the deal, otherwise you forget about it, you know? So, Don't management. <laughs> you know, management is a strange thing anyway, mm. you know, so managers don't really understand about music, they try just to, to, to stick with the business, but there's some little in between things mm. that just maybe some people who are into music know. Did you ever have the feeling that your studies helped you on that aspect? Mm, more of a down-to-earth uh, approach to the business, yeah. Mm. How do you get a down-to-earth approach to business in no, I studying never, never economics? No, I never sort of I mean. fly with fantasy mm. like, oh yeah, like, oh, this DJ has played my song, mm. so I'm gonna sell fucking loads or I'm gonna... I'm gonna, I'm gonna do great, or, you know, I've always been like, yeah, yeah it's another record. Uh, you know, another little thing in the archive, you know, like, let's, it's cool, let's make an X1, you know, I never really, so I always kept, like, uh, my, my feet on the ground with a normal job and uh, try to do music in spare time and, you know, like, produce when I have time, but never count on this 100%. So this way I'm always free to, do what you to really never want. compromise on quality. I just want to make one song. I think one song is very deep, 
well, I think it's great, I release it. You know? But um, yes, that's the ideal scenario and probably the subtext to all this would be reality check or something similar. But um, you've been talking about a lot of different aspects and how you want to do them all on your own. But how do you actually manage to fit all of that plus the regular job into one week? How does your week look like? Well, working during the week, mm. some email uh, business, you know, to run things, to, to get in contact with people, like sometimes in the night or whatever. What's your day lunch, job, anyway? Lunch break. Um, I work in, um, in a family company, you know, so we, we trade with fruits. <laughs> So it's like, uh, you know, w w waking up early in the morning and finishing mm. quite late. So at the same time, I have some my, my spaces to, mm. to send my emails, to do my, to go to a post and send some CDRs. To okay, so is it more like a hands-on thing or an office? No, office job, office mm. job. So I still have time. Mm. And on weekends, or traveling for DJing, mm. or when I'm not DJing, uh, I go to the studio. Mm -hmm. So I try to finish songs very fast. Uh, usually in two sessions, mm -hmm. two sessions. Like uh, I, I do a demo or something, and then during the week, I can let it breathe, put it in my car, and mm -hmm. then the next weekend or in a couple of weeks, boom, go and, and finish it. You say you try to. How does the actual process look like? What do you mean? When you said you try to finish it and one or two sessions? Well, you know, it really depends from the songs, if, mm. you, if you're inspired, you know. For example, with remixes, it's always a bit difficult because uh, there, there might be some stuff that is really inspiring you, mm. and, you, you know, the remix comes out like bang, you know, like because you really like the parts you have. Sometimes, with, you know, with the lack of good parts, it's a bit mm. tricky, you know, so you have to push yourself a little bit more. What with are you looking for in the parts? With your, uh, Nowadays, just vocals. Mm. If I have to do an instrumental remix, it's a bit tougher because I know I'm going to change everything from the drums and uh, the bass line is going to be... So unless there's uh, some, I don't know, some, some, some instruments like flutes or horns mm. or, or guitar or something, but instrumental remixes are a, a bit more tricky. Uh, or you have to just replay like a brand new track and you just sort of replay the melody of of that song sometimes, you know, just to sort of to give an idea. But I've done remixes, to be honest, mm -hmm. where I just didn't use any sound from the original. Because like, it's some, sometimes like people ask you for doing a 12, you know, to do a 12 is like two, three songs. And because of the scarcity of time, you know, if I do a 12, I want to do it for myself, for my label, or just keep tracks for my albums. So you end up doing a remix of some songs that you might don't like and you do a brand new track. But why do you do it then in the first place if you don't like it? Because, because you like the guys, you have a connection mm. with them, you go and DJ in their place and they're so nice, they're so enthusiastic, so why not, you know? I think uh, it's really important to, to still have like some sort of good relationship with people, you know? And the people who make sacrifices for, for the music, I, I always respect them, you know? So you do remixes for people you like, where you don't like the tracks, and you end up... No, but maybe they have, a, they have a track on the label that I'm not really mm -hmm. mad about, or there's not many parts you can use for, mm -hmm. for making a remix, but then you, you do a version, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, like a, it's like a song, you know? And then you say, yeah, I use some of the bongos, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I think it's... It was the same computer. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. same program, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the same program. Hmm. Did you ever get any grief for that? No, no, mm. you know, if you do a good job, you know, mm. the artist is happy. Mm. Okay. Um, but, you know, if you, mm. if, you get, if you get a vocal track, you know, mm. you use the vocals, it's, it's mm. easy, it's better. Mm. But coming back to, um, well, that, that would be the uh, remix process, but about your own tracks, you think about that's them easier, during the that's week? That's easier, because, yeah, because you, mm. go, you, you go to the studio with a certain state of mind, you listen in the car to certain music, or you play certain tracks, maybe the night before DJing. And so you, you're up for going there and just mm. maybe going to the studio and jam. And it's really, I mean, I come really fast with, with tracks. And the way I work is, uh, you know, get a groove going and then, like, uh, recording audio, loads of stuff, like, I, 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 you know, like percussions and shakers and, you know, stuff like that, loads of Afro-Brazilian percussions and stuff. So you get groove going really, really fast, you know? And then you, you sort of write a melody and then, you, 
you know, you have it decide to finish off, you know, to sort of like give a structure edit the following session, or you know, you, you take a couple of more sessions because if you want to write a vocal or you invite a vocalist to, to join you for, for the song, you know. <coughs> but uh, I have a feeling that you know a track, a very good track, the best track we've done, we're always done in very little time. Can we hear one of these best tracks then? Probably um, the quickest one. <laughs> the quickest one is a remix we've done with Dom, actually. I think that is like uh, one of the quickest uh, job if I find. Are you ashamed now? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a remix for Digo, but it didn't give us any part. So we replayed the, the bass line. Yeah. Yeah. The bass line? Well, yeah, we played the bass line, the same notes. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we found there was like this old hip hop sample, and <coughs> we sort of. So yeah, that was like not three hours maybe or something. So there was more in the spirit of the reggae version. Yeah, we just we it. just find this this break which is uh, from atmosphere actually, and we just chopped Patrick it. Patrick Adams atmosphere or yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and um, we just jam on it and we just yeah we play the bass line, mm -hmm. find the samples you know mm -hmm. to do the scratch kind of thing, and just edit it you know and the sound sounded just just right at that moment and we never. Never really retouch it, so... We never look back. <laughs> Another... That's like a mix I've done myself. It's with some vocals, you know. So, is it quicker when you work on your own, or is it... No, Dom is very quick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, what's the story there? I mean, how do you communicate about it? Is there a quick... And this is done with that process of just getting a groove, just recording all the shakers, get the samples, you know, chop some of the vocals, and then, you know, it's a very, very fast approach. But because the vocals were right and, you know, inspiring, so you just click and do it, you know? I mean, a good suggestion I, I, I can give to people is do, doesn't really get stuck in one song and just playing it over and over and over, you know, because then you don't really get the right detachment to it, from it, you know? You just stuck into it, you wake up, and you, you still have it in your ears. And it's really hard then to decide what to, to cut, what to change, because you still got just that thing in your head, you know? And lots of young producers do one song, and they think it's great, and then they do it for four months. And, but <laughs> sometimes they just, they just live with that track, you know? Sometimes you should just do one song, leave it for a while, then come to it after and say, oh yeah, it's good, no, maybe it's not good, or, you know, I should change this, and do more stuff. And if something doesn't really work, you have really to push it too hard, then maybe it's time to change and start a brand new song, you know? I think it's, uh, because the best things usually come very quickly, because it's just like, smooth, you know, it's a smooth process. How do you keep the mental energy up it needs to create um, a certain, vision of a sound. I mean, when you, when you close your eyes while listening to this, you would not think of Italian teenagers on the piazza. You would not think of, well, the Friday night club with um, a lot of hot looking people, but I mean, you're thinking of big sound systems, wooden floors, sweaty people, maybe some type of a New York setup or whatnot. Clubs which probably don't even exist anymore. How do you... Um, put yourself into that state when you're doing the music? Well, the more I go on, the more I get older, the more I, I try to make songs, you know, mm -hmm. like, so I try still to, to do like, uh, well, stuff that I want to listen in my car, you know? I, this is like on the edge, you know? <laughs> it's quite clabby, but still got that sort of song approach. But the, more, the stuff I'm working now, like, it's like I'm doing like a house album under this isolate um, name, you know? But it's really like, songs and uh, which have 4-4 four, four kind of formula but still still not like too much formula like but still like that I think are good just just for listening you know but um, 
you know, as I told you, like, I'm not really bothered about, like, the Italian market or how it is, just, just you know, like, I can hang out in the piazza with my mates, at the same time go in the, in my small room and make, like, a dirty song for, for like, a dance floor in Detroit or whatever, you know, it just, uh, I think it's just the passion of music that moves you, you know. But Even if my friends time. doesn't really like maybe what I'm doing, you know, I'm, I never really pushed or started playing and give CDs to friends, it's, you know, whatever, you know, everyone has got his taste. I'm not pushy, you know, at all, you know. That's why, for example, I don't really do much marketing on, on, on promotion on the, on, the, on the stuff, you know. Like, I, I like to, the stuff to arrive in the shops and then let the people judge. Usually, we have, like, you know, the guy who always, always works at the, at the stores, you know, that gives suggestions to people, sort of always like uh, what we do, so we give tips to people and we are, you know. In Japan, you know, people are really into it. So, yeah, the only, the only work maybe we do is with the Japanese market because people are really into this sort of thing. So maybe we, we, we take the time to go and tour and play certain things or, or maybe I send CDs to the guys from the stores so they do pre-orders. But uh, apart from that, I just let the market decide if it's good or not, you know? Um, with certain types of sound, certain distributors are associated with it. How important is it for you to find the right one and be part of? Well, I'm, I'm with a distributor called Goya, uh, and I'm working with them since the very, very beginning. And Goya is oft, always associated with the so-called West London broken beat scene. Uh, well, because it's based in West London, and because you know most of the labels came from that area. I started working with them like six, seven years ago, you know. And mainly because I, I used to buy uh, these records from these local people, and people was distributed by this company, and people mm -hmm. was actually owned by this company. And I was freaking out because the records were so deep, and I was like, I need, I need to, to, to get my records out through, through the same channel, you know? And I, I went there, and at that time, Goya had just, like, people, and uh, Main Squeeze, which was, like, IG culture label, but was just at the very beginning. And, and um, the Bugs and Betty guys started with a bittersweet label at that time, you know, the first release. And I sort of went there, I saw the people had the right uh, vibe, with, like the same music as me, so I said, okay, let's try. And then Digo joined like a few weeks later, then I convinced also Alex Atias to start the label called Visions. But he already wanted to start the label, but to join the same camp. And we were doing our things. You know, there were some periods where you know the records were charted by everyone, were seemed to be very successful. But uh, we were guessing why? Why are we selling like all right? But we hear people around selling much more than us, you know. And the records are never charted, or you know, they don't seem to have the same kind of appeal to people. Uh, but in the last two, three years, we saw you know with all these companies, uh, distribution companies going bankrupt. Uh, this, and the natural selection I told before about the quality. It seems like we always sell the same amount of copies. Mm. Uh, you know. and, 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 and the other distributor and the other labels are, more, are suffering more. So I think the quality policy that Goya had mm. uh, paid, especially in the last two years, you can see the results of that uh, sticking with your own sound kind of thing. A couple of the few remaining distributors are now just swamped with stuff because all the people who were with others are just taking lo literally lorries, collecting their stuff and driving it over to the other one. Did all this turmoil in the distribution scenario um, affect you at all? No, I think, you know, when you, when you create uh, something, you know, like if I was starting now, maybe yes, but because the labels are running since one since seven years, one since four years. Mm. You, you have your own niche of people. we always, if you deliver a certain quality, people will buy your stuff, will follow, you know, mm. at least go to the shop and listen to it. And maybe mm. they don't buy it, but, you know, from the numbers I see that, you know, these core people are always buy the record. And then there's a, a larger audience that sometimes buy it or not, depends from the release. I didn't see any change really in, the, in terms of, of sales. I, I guess for someone who has to start with a label, it's, it's harder now because, you know, because there are just few companies. The companies cannot take 15,000 labels, you know, mm. because they, otherwise they don't do a good job, you know. You know when, you, when, you, when, you, when you go to a distribution company, you have to be sure that 
they're going to work your product. They have to be enthusiastic about your product. They have, they have to like it. The, the seller has to go, over, yeah, I like this. You have to buy this. You have to call the other guy in Switzerland. Yeah, you have to buy 50 of these. Oh, no, I just want to take 20. No, buy 50, you know? Has to be, and so if he, he likes the music and if he's convinced that he's going to do a good job. Did you dabble with any sort of inter uh, internet distribution so far? No, I, I'm, I've, uh, I was one of the first um, <coughs> to sort of, you know, try to do a website, which was more than the usual, uh, you know, first... A little nerd first. Yeah, page and, and mm. email thing, so we mm. tried to be a bit creative with the website. And what did you do for those? Well, we did uh, some funny galleries with some pictures with some of the people involved, and uh, we, we tried to have as many information as possible on, on the releases. Uh, and uh, try to change graphically all the time, you know, try to keep it interesting visually, you know, so you don't get bored uh, uh, surfing. But um, I never really joined any MP3 or company who sell. Mm. Nowadays, they're very famous, yeah? Mm. You know, there's a famous company, there's a, there's a case of one company apparently like selling MP3s of all possible labels without having any permissions, you know, so it's a big thing nowadays. Um, but the only thing... Discussed on many forums in the world, yeah. Yeah, yeah, every, every, everyone was, was oh, last week was, everyone was talking about this. And um, we want to make maybe like a little uh, web store to sell our release. Mm. But just, 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 you know, me, just, hey, you want the release, you can't find it in the shop, whatever, yeah, I'll send you, send you the record kind of thing. But because I don't have much time, mm. uh, it, it's taking me a little bit to do it. So with someone taking so much pride in the actual physical appearance of the record, um, how does something like joining iTunes appear to you then? At the moment, you know, there's, there's certain things like I, I haven't really mm. thought about. I, I, I still like to have a product, <laughs> a real pro product in my hand. Mm. So I just want to communicate that with people. The only thing I'm doing sometimes is like do special deals because um, mostly we do 12s, you know. Mm. But now we're starting with albums. What I do sometimes is special edition for Japan. Mm. Like we do like certain EPs on, on CD for Japan, mm. for the Japanese market and stuff. But like new, new technology at the moment, like ringtones or, mm. or iTunes, no, I'm not really really interesting because uh, you know with so much music I don't think many people would just start to go to look for this little underground track you know if it's an album maybe you can think about it you know you want to download the whole album but well, speaking of albums in Goya I mean Goya is literally situated on the back of a pretty large compound which is owned by Virgin Records so you got the two worlds literally back to back to each other mm -hmm. and now with um, for example Bucks being signed to V2, what do you think is going to be the outcome of that? I mean, the major policies have kind of changed as well, so... Yeah, but it's really strange, like... Uh, um, the year we released the Domo album on Archive, mm -hmm. uh, we did pretty well with that, with mm -hmm. Goya distributing it. We decided as a policy to, to sort of do a special price for Japan, which mm -hmm. where the record was supposed to be big. We did like a little discount, and that paid off because mm -hmm. it sold I think more than 2,500 copies in Japan, mm. which, were, which, is, which is for underground is, is very good. And nowadays, is, is for, you compare with the market, nowadays is very good. Mm. And at the same time, for example, IG was releasing its New Sector Movement album on, mm. on Virgin. And the record is great. Mm. New Sector Movement, first album for me was amazing. You know, I was really like, wow, you know, this is, this is great. But they didn't market it properly. I mean, th there was a great cover. I mean, they spent money on, on everything, you know, mm -hmm. like as a product. But then we didn't do much to support it mm -hmm. in the right way. And, and I think the record, I know the record mm -hmm. sold less than Domu. Mm -hmm. So it's funny, like Virgin mm -hmm. selling less copies of a product, but it could have been with Goya and sell more copies. But so I mean, what's the right way? Because I mean, especially Bucks, that's a little bit like the Wu-Tang Clan of West London. I mean, there's so many but different kinds. Bugs, bugs have, have a different sound, you know? Mm. They have a sound that is a mix of elements, mm. but, uh, and to be honest, like, now the sound has changed. The mm. early sound was different from what it is now, because mm. some of the people involved maybe now are doing other projects and everything. So now they have sound which is more booty or more, you know, yeah. bassy. And so it will appeal to the larger audience, mm. but, uh, 
you know, like, it's not exactly the, the old West London sound, you know, mm. and it's not exactly the old Goya sound. Mm. I mean, of course, everything is developing. I'm not like so old school, oh, yeah, I have to be that sound. Mm. 